And I want to say happy Mother's Day to my mom. I know she's listening. That can be intimidating. Uh, happy birthday to Hazel. Happy uh, Mother's Day to Hazel. Uh, it's kind of intimidating having your mother-in-law and your mother listening to you for every lesson. Um, but uh, all of you mothers out there, uh, happy Mother's Day on a very special day. Where would we be without you? have a trivia question for you to begin the lesson today. If the book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews, and the book of Galatians was written to Galatians, and the book of Thessalonians, two books of Thessalonians, were written to the Thessalonians, to whom was the book of James written? <laughs> the Hebrews. Doesn't that make sense? <clears throat> I want to talk to you about the little bit about the provenance of, of the, the book of James uh, to just give you a little bit of background because I think it's important that you know uh, some of the information, uh, where we got it, when we got it, who it came from. Um, who was the author? There you go. All right, let's start out well. Uh, it, it was authored by James under the inspiration, of course, of the Holy Spirit. Now, the difficulty we have here is that there were four Jameses mentioned in the New Testament. We had uh, James, the father of Judas, James, the son of Alphaeus, James, the brother of John and the son of Zebedee, and James, the brother of Jesus. Now, the James here isn't identified. In the, the first word in the book of James is James. So we know that uh, given the form of letters of that time, that he was the author. So that's left us to ponder, well, of which James are we speaking? Uh, it could well be James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee. However, his death was in A.D. 44, probably a little bit too early for this letter to have been written, and uh, there's no external evidence. In other words, history doesn't credit him with it. The other two Jameses, uh, James, the father of Judas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, were rather minor characters on the stage at that time, but one person who was... Um, a well-known figure uh, in, the, in the early church and would not have to have been identified by other than his first name uh, would have been James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, this seems a bit odd because in Mark we read that James uh, was of the brothers of Jesus. And by the way, it lists his brothers and, and any time you see that list, James is always listed first. So the indication is he was likely the eldest after after Jesus. In other words, uh, he was the son of Mary and Joseph, but he was the oldest son, the next oldest son after, after Jesus. Um, as we find out that, that he thought Jesus was crazy, as did all his other brothers. Uh, and so now we get to the early church and we find out that he's one of the preeminent apostles. And you've got to ask yourself, how did this happen? Did you ask yourself how it happened? Okay. <laughs> I asked myself how it happened, how you go from making fun of him to being one of the leaders in the, in the apostolic group. Well, the answer is, is found in 1 Corinthians when Paul tells us that after Jesus was written, he appeared to, and it said he appeared to James. Uh, we also read in early in Acts that when Jesus, uh, at his resurrection, appeared uh, to the apostles and also his brothers and sisters. So he saw the risen Christ and all the fun that he'd made of him uh, when, he, when he was uh, uh, during his ministry. Uh, that didn't exist anymore because he realized he was who he said he was. So he was one of the leaders of the early church. Um, we do know that, uh, uh, that at, at the description of the times, the, the, the words that are used in the book of James indicate an early authorship because... Uh, uh, it mentions the synagogue, for example, which, wasn't, uh, it, which was uh, listed as the church in other in, uh, Pauline writings, for example. So uh, my best estimate is that this, this book was written probably about A.D. 50. I don't know if that means anything to you, and unless you're a history buff, but I want you to stop and think of it in this, in this light, uh, that if Jesus died in, in A.D. 33 to 34, then this was only 15, 16 years after that. So you've got one of, either this or Galatians, we figured, was the first New Testament book written, likely James. So we know this was written early on. Um, a little bit of trivia here. Uh, it was not viewed as canonical by Martin Luther. 
who dug in his heels quite a bit and said, wait a minute, there's so, such an emphasis on works in James uh, that it was in opposition to Paul's teachings about grace, and so he didn't think it could, should be canonical. Some others didn't uh, also, but uh, as you can tell, the, 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 mo- the majority of the church leaders, I believe led by the Holy Spirit, felt that it was, and so it was included in the body of the canon. One thing that I, I like about this book is I called it last week whack-a-mole theology Uh, and and if you've ever played the whack-a-mole at the state fair uh, this is a little bit like Proverbs in that you can't have uh, for example in in one chapter uh, chapter one of James uh, and you know you might think well we'll discuss the overriding theme of chapter one huh There are a lot of themes in chapter 1. There are a lot of different uh, topics that are undertaken, and it's just ready, fire, 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 fire. So uh, he he doesn't dwell a whole lot on any one topic, but they are deep, each and every one of them. So you've got to kind of stop and separate them out. Another thing is that uh, this wasn't a personal letter. As you look through, it says, Greetings. But uh, it, he doesn't mention any single person. He doesn't mention a place in time or like Paul when he hopes to be reunited with him. There's nothing personal about this letter. So the implication here is that this was meant to be a circulatory letter. That he wrote it for the benefit, and it tells us right here, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. This was not too terribly long after the stoning of Stephen when Acts tells us that the church was dispersed that the Christians were pretty much scattered all over the globe and started to plant churches everywhere. So the indication is he was writing to those new churches. Uh, and this was almost a, to whom it may concern, as I said earlier, just to, the, to believers wherever they may be. But from the tone of this, it's pretty easy to tell that he was writing to Hebrew believers, that he was writing to Jews. So just like the book of Hebrews that we just finished was, had a Jewish audience, so also does this. So let's start with with the first verse and kind of dig into it because it gets heavy pretty quickly. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how remarkable that is, what he just said? Any of you got an older sibling? Come on now, anybody got older siblings? Okay. Did you have a little bit of conflict with them here and there? Was there any what we call sibling rivalry? Um, well, if I put it in this perspective, uh, uh, for example, if my younger son Ty said, a servant of my brother John, ain't going to happen. <laughs> ain't going to happen. Uh, they're good friends, but, and, and we already know that James called him crazy uh, when, when Jesus was, during his, was uh, in his ministry. And so this was pretty remarkable. But now how does he identify himself? A servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ his older brother, written to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Uh, That doesn't seem to be too remarkable, but that is not, the word greetings uh, is translated just exactly like it came from the Greek, and it's not a word that Paul uses, for example. Paul uses grace and peace and other terms like that. This was a formal greeting that would have been used in the Greek secular society. Greetings to all the churches. And then immediately he gets into a very difficult concept. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Anybody here do that? You thank God for your trials, uh, for your, your very difficult health diagnoses, for the tragedies in your life? Uh, I struggle with this. I just want to tell you. Uh, but I think that as you read how it follows... Uh, you find out that James is not intimating that we ought to request tragedies in our life. We ought not to pray for bad things to happen or difficult things to happen, which is what trials mean here, uh, just so that we can develop courage, develop faith. That's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is they're going to come. We've talked about this a number of times. And uh, as I shared with some old friends here lately, we're all going to encounter tragedy in our lives. We're all going to be touched in some way or another. How do we respond to them, I think, is a mark of our faith. And he says, consider it joy when you face them. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Um, I don't know how else you can look at it. I do know that the trials and tragedies that I faced in my own personal life have helped me 
to, to develop my faith because they test it. They test it. Sometimes deeply they test it. I've had some very deep conversations with God about how these things happen. I, I try to avoid why do you let them happen because I don't believe that, uh, that, that that's an issue. But I do have to say, God, I know these things happen. And I know that you want to get my attention with them. And I know that it's going to make me stronger. But in the middle of my circumstances, I struggle with that. But look what he says. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So he says, when you come out the backside, after you've, after you've passed through it, uh, and things are a little more normal, although you may be changed forever, that you will have developed character and you will have developed maturity. Now, it looks like he's completely shifting gears here, but I want you to stop and think. I think these two are related. Look what he says. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. I think what he's doing when he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, is this. That as you're going through these trials, you may be asking questions. And if you like the wisdom, ask God. Because he's going to have an answer for you. Uh, there's one, one kind of caveat with that. If you, if you ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave to the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. So he says, ask God for wisdom. But don't ask it capriciously. Don't ask it saying, well, it couldn't hurt. Have you ever had anybody say to you, well, a little prayer wouldn't hurt? Ouch. Ouch. I think, that, I think that's what God says, too. Ouch. You mean you're doing this just because it couldn't hurt? So here's what he says. When you ask God, you need to ask him expecting that he can give you an answer. The answer may not be what you want. The answer may be wait. The answer may be I'm not going to tell you at this time. You may know later, but you have to expect that he can. And if you don't, you're kind of like the, the wave of the sea. You're, you're kind of tossed about. Well, it wouldn't hurt. That's like one of the things that I struggle with today with our college ministry when we're working with kids is you'd be amazed at how many of the kids claim a vague spirituality. Uh, that is, in fact, a, a spiritual smorgasbord where they pick a little bit of Christianity and I'll take a little bit of Buddhism and I'll like this from what I read of the great teachers and I'll kind of form it around my preconceptions. And that's a person who's tossed by the wind because you have no anchor. And that's what he's talking about here. That man should not think he would receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. So what he's saying is if you say, okay, it, you know, God, whatever, I don't think you're going to do this, but please give me wisdom, you're wasting your time. You're just wasting your time. Now, he's going to shift gears completely. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. That sounds like an oxymoron there, doesn't it? Wait a minute, you're humble, and in that he means poor, essentially, then uh, if you're poor, then you ought to take pride in your wealth. That's what he says. Um, if you know the teachings of the Lord, that's not an oxymoron at all. Because who's going to be greatest? Who's, he who is the least. Uh, how difficult is it for a person with wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven? It's easier for the camel to enter the, the eye of the needle, to go through the eye of the needle. So he's using this, uh, this example, and he's about to turn the the, the pages in just a minute and, and uh, let you see the other side. The brother in humble circumstances ought to be proud of his, of his exalted position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position. Now that's kind of interesting. That's a warning to those who have, who have authority, who have privilege, that they ought to be humble. And if they're going to take pride in anything, take pride in your humility and not in your exalted position. Because you'll pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. 
So his point is this, and it's, it's, it's an old saw. I mean, it's, you've heard this forever. You can't take it with you. You know, there are no pockets in funeral shrouds. You, know, you just listen to all those things, and they're all true. The fact is, when you're gone, the only thing you can take with you is the legacy that you lived while you were here. Not your money and not your stuff. So if you count on your stuff, you're counting on the wrong thing. So he's saying, okay, you who are wealthy, who are privileged, who have position, uh, you, you ought to take pride in humility because all that other stuff's going to be gone, and that's all you'll have at the end. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Uh, this is shot throughout Scripture, uh, particularly in Revelation. Uh, per, particularly in the letters to the churches, uh, you hear the word persevere a lot. Um, and as I, a couple of weeks ago, was at a reunion with friends, and uh, we were catching up on 45 years and the things that had befallen all of us in those 45 years, I began to understand the meaning of the word persevere. Persevere. Uh, we are going to be buffeted about. We're going to be knocked in the head. We're going to be knocked down. Uh, and the Bible tells us to get up, get up, get up. To whom is he writing? He is writing to Jewish Christians scattered around the globe. Why were they scattered? Persecution. That's why they're scattered. Uh, in Hebrews, he is beseeching, uh, the author of Hebrews is beseeching those not to fall away under persecution. And that's kind of what James is saying here. He said, blesses the man who perseveres. You are going to have trials. But the blessing is on the other side. The blessing is to those who persevere, who don't give up. Now, now he changes gears a little bit here, and I love this one because I see this a lot. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. You remember Flip Wilson? Remember Geraldine? And he would sit here like this and say, the devil made me do it. And that was funny was not true. It's not true. Will the devil tempt you? Absolutely he will. But another thing that we know from Scripture is God's not going to allow you to be tempted without also providing a way out. In other words, you can't say, I have been irre you know, irresistibly tempted. I didn't have a choice. You've got a choice. But when tempted, you shouldn't say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Let me stop right there. God does not tempt anyone. Now, does that mean that God will not allow Satan to tempt you? He will. Didn't he allow Satan to tempt Jesus? He did. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness and, and for him to be tempted by the devil. God allowed Satan to tempt uh, Job, for example. So you may be tempted, but it wasn't God doing it. Don't, don't mix that up because he doesn't tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire. Let me stop right there. If you didn't have an evil desire, you couldn't be tempted, right? Um, unfortunately, we are all fallen people. I had a very, I'm going to chase a rabbit just a minute. I can't stand it. I had a very interesting conversation with one of our Southwestern kids about uh, the fact that we had invited members of the gay and lesbian group to come to our Southwestern lunch. We would love to come and, and eat with them, get to know them. Um, and someone asked, well, you probably wouldn't let them come to your church. I said, we certainly would. We certainly would. On what basis would I deny someone to, to walk down the aisle and, and worship with us? Because if I stopped everyone at the back door who was a, was a sinner, how many would be here today? Just Nancy. <laughs> Not Nancy? Okay. None of us would be here. None of us would be here. So we have our own evil desires, Okay. But one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, I want you to stop and think of the progression here. 
You've already got an evil desire, and that desire is conceived. When you do something you know you're not supposed to be doing, and at whatever point that, you know, the synapses move around in your brain and you make that decision that I'm going to do it, that's when desire is conceived. It will give birth to the act. It will give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Um, Does that mean that next time you sin, you're going to drop dead? Maybe, but that's not what this means. What, what this means is that death is when you have made the decision to step away from God. You have separated yourself from God by your conscience decision to sin. Um, Karen and I record some judge shows sometimes. We'll be sitting around watching the judge show, and uh, uh, one guy will uh, admit that he had an affair, and he said, and it just happened. Huh? 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 It just happened. Hate it when that happens to me, you know? So it didn't just happen. Uh, The evil desire was there. Uh, The sin was conceived. Uh, And when the act was done, then there was the death of the separation from God when it happened. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. I love the wording there. Uh, James is not normally, through the, rest of the, uh, through the rest of the letter, although his Greek is first-rate scholarly Greek, it's not flowery, beautiful language like you find, for example, in the Gospel of John. But here, he does paint a beautiful picture. Every good thing that happens comes from above. Coming down, look at this. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. We do not serve a capricious God. He is not a God uh, who who rules at a whim. Uh, God does not change. If you remember my example from last week of the the principle of a, a compass, where would we be if magnetic north moved all the time? You know, where, where would our standard be on what could we focus? Uh, God does not move. He does not change like, uh, 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 like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. Uh, remember when Jesus said, I am the way and the truth? Okay. Through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. What's important about first fruits? They were offered as a sacrifice. Those were the perfect things that were offered back to God as a sacrifice. Now he's going to change, uh, change tactics just again. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I'm going to stop right there because I, he's speaking to me. I don't know about the rest of you. But this is one that when I read, do you ever read Scripture when you just say, oh, oh, ouch. Well, Although perhaps I'm, I'm working with this, uh, I struggle with this, uh, this is my sin, my particularly one that I pray about. Quick to, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Too often, I am ready, fire, aim. Oh, I am. Ready, fire, aim. Um, And have you ever spoken a word and had it come out of your mouth and you could almost see the word floating away and you, oh, come back, come back. I can't believe I just said that. But it landed before you could catch it. Wow. I feel horrible when that happens. Be slow to speak and slow to become angry for man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So whenever I feel anger or irritation or such, I don't know about you, but I kind of shrink back and say, how does that glorify Jesus? How happy is God at at this emotion right now? Let me tell you, there is such a thing as righteous anger. Don't get me wrong. But be honest with yourself. Is most of your anger righteous? I'm getting no response from you here. (laughs) I'll preach to myself. Most... Most of, most of those responses are not, are not righteous. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So 
these things don't seem to be related, but believe me, they are. Because the moral filth is not just uh, filthy language, uh, filthy pictures, filthy, any kind of pil- filthy life, although we, you do need to get rid of that. But any moral filth is anything that's contrary to, the purpose, to God's will and purpose. And if you're angry, that's moral filth. He doesn't want it. So he says, get rid of that and all the other kind of evil and humbly accept that word. Listen to this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after, going, after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, so just kind of hold that thought. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Uh, I, I want you to notice real quickly here he said perfect law. He's writing to a Jewish audience, remember? So he's not talking about the Mosaic law. When he's talking about the perfect law, he's talking about grace. So when he says, when you look into grace and see that that gives you freedom, because if he was talking about the law, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, it wouldn't give you freedom. So he's talking about grace. When you look into that and you continue to do it, not forgetting what you've heard, but doing it, he'll be a blessing in what he does. In other words, you've heard the word. You've heard it from uh, Past, some of you from Jesus himself, from the others, from the apostles, uh, when it was shared with you, when you hear that and do it, that's when you're perfect. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. When you, have you ever stopped and think what it would be like to fill this pulpit? Let me tell you, it's an awesome task. Uh, I was here last Sunday, and uh, every time I get up here, I can't help but look out there and think, there are 600 people out here thinking, where's Dan? (laughs) But uh, you share what the Lord has for you to share, and and many times I'm surprised at the reactions. Because sometimes you're, you're tired, you feel off, whatever. I think that's when God uses you most, actually. But... uh, um, I walked away last Sunday saying, well, okay, I did my best. Um, I probably received more comments about last week's message than any I've ever preached. And apparently I hit a nerve when I said, you know what, uh, the Bible says a whole lot more, a whole lot more about gossip than it does same-sex marriage. And, and I heard from a lady whose uh, daughter and her partner attend here on occasion, and they want to get married. They're both women. Uh, and she said, when you started down that trail, I thought you were going to start into the fire and brimstone condemnation, but I was surprised at what you said. Uh, I think a lot of people were surprised at that because uh, uh, we're comfortable with our gossip. We're just not comfortable with same-sex marriage. Which, which one is a sin? Both. Which one is more harmful to the church? Gossip. No doubt. The Bible tells us that many, many times. And look what it says. If you consider yourself religious and don't keep a tight rein on your tongue, you deceive yourself and your religion is worthless. I have people out there ought to be saying, ouch. Ouch. That is the most insidious, harmful thing to a church other than false teaching. Is, is, is same-sex marriage good for our society? No, absolutely not. I, I, I'll, I'll state that unequivocally. But we worry so much about that and seem, seemingly give gossip a pass. As a matter of fact, it's kind of like a church hobby. Uh, I will say, I will say, I see less damage from it here. I'm amazed uh, at how little of that I encounter. But when I do, it's nasty. It's nasty. And it said, look, if you say you're a religious person and you're gossiping, you just, you just proved yourself a liar because your religion is worthless. And this is what I love, and this is what got James a little bit in trouble with Martin Luther. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That's amazing to me. Plain and simple. Here it is. You want to know what religion that that God finds desirable? And I know you're thinking, he really wants us to come on Wednesday nights to prayer meeting. I serve on three committees. I'm a deacon. I have a quiet time in the morning. 
And look what he's saying. Prove it. Prove it. Because if your religion is valuable, then there will be fruit. Here's some fruit that you care for widows and orphans in their distress. And you don't allow yourself to be polluted by the world. That's not a works theology, guys. It's not a works theology. James knew as well as anyone that salvation is by, by grace through faith alone. He knew that. But he said, if you have it, if you have been saved, then there will be fruit. And here's the fruit. Something that just jumped out at me, though, and I wanted to kind of share this with you. Is, it's our central point today. I'm going to pick out at verses 22, and 24, 22 through 24. Anyone who listens to the word, excuse me, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. Let me stop right there. I want to share a little story with you. Uh, a couple went on a three-week dream vacation, and they left their college-age son to look after the house. You're already laughing. <laughs> you know how this is going to turn out, don't you, right? Okay. Uh, they filled the refrigerator for him, and then they left a detailed lift of responsibilities. Feed and walk the dog. Water the lawn. Pick up the mail. Bring in the newspapers. Keep the house clean. When they returned from their trip, they pulled into the driveway and found it littered with newspapers still in the plastic wrappers. The mailbox was stuffed so full that mail was falling out into the street. The lawn was brown. When they entered the house, it was a mess. The dog was missing. They found their son in, the room, in his room playing a video game. And, and understandably upset, the father said, Son, what happened? We left you with everything you needed, and we just asked you to follow some simple instructions. The son said, Yeah, Dad, they were great instructions. I read them every morning. I even memorized some of them. I shared them with my friends, and they thought they were great too. We even had a small group session to get together and talk about your instructions and how complete they were. We agreed that those instructions were just about all I'd need to keep the house in order. How do you think Jesus feels? He went away and he left us some very specific instructions. And we read them. We have large classes about them. We have small groups about them. We study them. We agree that they're about all that we need to keep our house in order. Jordan, one evening uh, in the Alive service, preached a stem winder. If you haven't been to the Alive service, you need to come. Preached a stem winder of a message about this very, this very scripture. How easy it is for us to be all wrapped up in our own righteousness about the fact that we study the Bible. But what about caring for widows and orphans? What about doing this stuff? I'm guilty too. I mean, I, I find myself, because it's my job teaching it, uh, this is my, the tools of my trade right here, that sometimes it's easy to forget that there's a practical application. There are lots of practical application, and those are the fruits of the Spirit. So that's my prayer this week. That in all the, the great points that, that the apostle is, is sharing with us here, that one thing that we do remember when we study this, make it more than an intellectual or even a spiritual exercise. That every week we should take something away and say, okay, as a result of having read the first chapter of James, what am I going to do? What am I going to take with me? How can I make the rubber actually hit the road from the lesson today? And that's your challenge. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for these who come uh, to share it. And Father, my prayer is that not only for me, but for everyone present, that, that our religion would not be worthless. Father, that it, that it goes into action. Father, I just want to pray for our, our congregation during this very difficult time and pray that as our pastor shared this morning, that we be the light and the salt of this world. I do want to ask a special prayer this week, Father, for Max's family. 
I want to thank you for his commitment to you and ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit provide them the comfort and peace uh, that they need in this very difficult time. For I ask these things in the precious name of your Son. Amen.